Shia Islam encourages people to ask questions and to inquire into the truth if one has reservations. It places great emphasis on not just knowing but understand the beliefs and acknowledging the truth. So when I look into the event of Ghadir, many questions are raised. If Ghadir was that important for the religion of Islam, why have so many people rejected the succession of Imam Ali? You know, of course there must be some sort of justification. So I've set myself the task to find out the reason behind it. Why are the Shia Muslims so driven by the event of Ghadir? You know, why do they turn a sermon into one of the biggest Eids of their calendar? As we know, Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi, is the, primarily the cousin of the Prophet of Islam. Mm -hmm. So the son of his uncle Abu Talib. What we also understand is that he was like the younger brother of the Prophet of Islam because there was an age difference between the two. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, he himself mentions that his older brother, the Prophet of Islam, he would follow him and gain from his teachings in the way that a young child of a camel would follow its mother. Oh, wherever yes, yeah, the child, yeah. wherever the mother will go for water and for food and whatever, the child will follow. He of says, course. I did, had the same relationship with the Prophet of Islam. So yes, he was related to him uh, through family. Also, he was his very close friend and confidant, as we know. Uh, we hear reports of during the primary formative stages of Islam. Mm -hmm. uh, the Prophet of Islam would, for example, be in the middle of the Hijaz in Mecca, for example, praying Salah. And the Arabs at the time, the Mushrikeen, would say that we would see two people next to him. Mm. And we don't know what they were doing. They would be bowing down and going into a type of prostration. We didn't know what this was. Okay. One of them was his cousin, brother and friend Ali bin Abi Talib. Salam Allah Salam Allah and the other was his wife, Lady Khadija. Mm. And we'd see that they were always together. Also, we understand that there needs to be a differentiation between the companions and Amir al-Mu'mineen. What do I mean? There was a very famous, well-known uh, Sunni alim scholar who had many followers. We don't need to mention his name. He asks his son one day, mm -hmm. which of the companions of the Prophet of Islam were the best? So uh, he replied and gave certain names. So the father said, you've done a big uh, zulm and injustice. This is a Sunni alim? The Sunni alim. Okay. To his son. To his son, okay. He says, why have I done zulm and injustice? He said, you mentioned all of these names, but you forgot Ali bin Abi Talib, salam Allah Ali. So the son, what does he reply? The son replies, no father, you have made a mistake. He says, what? You ask me who are the greatest companions of the Prophet of Islam. Okay. The son says, Ali ibn Abi Talib isn't a companion, he's part of Ahlul Bayt. Uh -huh. And there's a difference between a companion and he who is part of the house. Because a companion is external to the house. Mm. There are certain things a companion isn't taught. But a person who's part of the house is aware of all of the affairs of that house. Wow. That's why when it comes to the riwayah, they speak, they say how Ali ibn Abi Talib to the Prophet is like the head to the body. Why? What does this mean? Because without the head, you can't recognize the person. Mm -hmm. Without Amir al muminin you can't recognize the Prophet of Islam. Wow. So this is how we understand the relationship of Amir al muminin with the Holy Prophet. So, the, because the event of Ghadir is has been a disputed topic, very much a very disputed topic. Oh. You know, how did the event of Ghadir take place? You know, what actually happened on that day? As we know, the Prophet of Islam on the 10th year after Hijrah, so after migrating uh, to Medina to Munawwara, he performs what we call Hajjatul Wada, which was also called Hajjatul Balagh, Hajjatul mm. Kamal, the mm. final Hajj. Okay. The only Hajj that the Prophet of Islam performs in his life. Mm. In this Hajj, he would say, Khud minni manasikakum. Take from me the rituals of Hajj. So he told the people, you need to do Hajj. You need to perform Hajj at least once in your lifetime. Mm -hmm. This farewell Hajj, come with me, accompany me, and take from me the ahkam of Hajj, how to perform the Hajj. So we are told a large group of Muslimin, number one, conglomerated and came in Medina to Munawwara itself, Others, they met the Prophet of Islam on the path, on the way to Mecca. Okay. Why? To perform the farewell hajj, the last hajj with the Prophet of Islam. Here history tells us that five or six days before Dhul Qa'dah, he leaves. Mm -hmm. And it was a Saturday that he left. 
as I said, the number of people with him, there are different reports, but in the hundreds of thousands. And the number of people that performed Hajj with him were even more. Why? Because there were some that were already in Mecca. Okay, yeah. When he gets, he performs the Hajj as we know. On his return from this farewell Hajj, on Thursday the 18th of the Hajjah, which we today know as the Eid al Khalil, mm -hmm. he stops in that place. There was water over there in that area, as we said, he stops in that place. Wherever there's water, obviously, there's people like to conglomerate, they like to yeah, come yeah, together. Of course, of course. Uh, some people had already gone ahead to Juhafa. He called them back. There were some people that were slightly slow in coming, he waited for them to come. He prays Salatul Dhuhr, and the historical reports mention that Jibra'il comes down with this verse of Quran, Ballig ma unzila alayka min rabbik. So spread the message of that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed to you. Wa in lam taf al fama ballakhtar salatah. And if you don't mention this message, you haven't given your risala, you haven't uh, spread the message of your prophethood. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, don't worry, you tell the people what the truth is, Allah will protect you from the people, wow. from any backlash that there may be. Wow. I.e. tell them about the wilaya of Amir al-Mu'mineen very clearly. Historical reports mention it was so hot that people would take their cloaks and abba and place it on their feet while praying the salah because of the heat from the pebbles yeah, yeah, and the ground. Yeah, yeah. When they come together, then the Prophet of Islam mentions his khutbah, his sermon, which is a very well-known sermon. After praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is soon to take my life. Okay. And I can soon tell that I will be called, and I'm going to say yes. I called by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to return to him, I'm going to say yes. And so I fear for my ummah. Mm. He would mention, can you hear me? They would say, yes, Ya Rasulullah. He said, I spoke to you about not leaving the thaqalain or thiqlain. One person says, what is the thaqalain? In this uh, hadith of Ghadir, he mentions again the, uh, the Qur'an. Okay, so twice. Ah, uh, twice. Okay. Uh, the, he says, of course, the, the Qur'an and my Ahlul Bayt. Okay. After which he goes to speak about the succession of Ali bin Abi Talib, alayhi, saying that if I have a wilaya over you, do you accept it? Awla bikum min anfusikum. Mm -hmm. They said, yes, we accept it. He said, in the same way, that same wilaya, Ali bin Abi Talib has. So he put over in context. Order. Exactly. Okay. So first he introduces himself. Do you accept me to be a wali over you, someone who has authority mm -hmm. and leadership? They said, yes. In the same way, then you have to accept. And then three times he says, man kuntu mawla, fahadha aliyun mawla. Mm -hmm. Some say that he mentions this on four occasions. After which this... Uh, very large number of people have heard, they then start coming towards Amir al-Mu'mineen mm. uh, to congratulate him. So okay. this is very briefly what takes place on the day. A sermon is given mm. and they say this is the longest sermon of the life of the Prophet. Wow. He never gave, gave a sermon that long. Why? It's the last sermon. Whatever he needed to mention to the Ummah, yeah, it's a yeah, great yeah. opportunity. He mentions many things in that sermon. Of course, the most important being this. At that time then, uh, Jibra'il comes down again. Okay. With the verse, اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم. Today you have completed your religion. وأتممت عليكم. I have completed your religion. وأتممت عليكم نعمتي ورذيت لكم الإسلام دينا. Today I've given you this religion complete. Okay. And so then, when the Prophet of Islam hears of the completion of religion, he is happy and says, Alhamdulillah, my Lord is happy with my risala, my messengership, and what I have given to the Ummah. Wow. Looking through many books. From both the Shia and Sunni sect, I have found that there are 256 narrations that speak about the event of Ghadir. One narration mentioned in a Sunni source that stated that Umar ibn al-Khattab, the second caliph, pledged his allegiance to Amir al-Mu'mineen and said to him that you are my leader and the leader of every Muslim. I carried out further research and found many narrations from Sunni books alone. I went online to look at different websites to gain a better understanding of what really happened in Ghadir. And to my surprise, I found 256 narrations that they were pretty similar to one another. One of the narrations I came across was one that stated that Umar ibn al-Khattab was one of the companions that pledged allegiance to Imam Ali and told him that you are my leader and the leader of every Muslim. Speaking to Sheikh Shabbar raised more questions and increased my curiosity. Why have a successor? And what is the importance of a successor? 
I reached out to Sheikh Mohammed Abbas Panju to help answer these questions. When we look into the history of successorship amongst the previous prophets, you always find that within the monotheistic faith, beginning from Adam all the way to Nabi Isa, the prophets were always appointed by Allah and declared by the Holy Prophet. None of them were elected. So for all the Anbiya from Adam to Isa, we have a trend that every one of these Anbiya have left behind, have appointed a successor upon the command of Allah. Then why the exception for Rasulullah, who is the Khatam of all Anbiya? Who is the greatest prophet? Who is the greatest of all prophets? And then Ba'd Khilaf al Quran, because it goes against the Quran, and we have verses within the Quran that speak about how the nomination and the appointment of the successor of the Prophet is a directive from Allah through the Holy Prophet. For example, if we were to refer to the Quran, what is the opinion of the Quran, if you could use the word opinion, mm -hmm. what is the opinion of the Quran when it comes to successorship? Can it be nominated or is it an appointment? Let us have a look at one verse in the Quran in particular, Surah Al-A'raf, verse number 142. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He is narrating for us the incident of Nabi Musa. Mm -hmm. Why does Allah mention stories in the Quran from other prophets? For us to learn from. Sahih? The idea of these stories of the past is for us to draw lessons from them. So keeping this in mind, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَوَعَدْنَ مُوسَى ثَلَثِينَ لَيْلَةً وَأَتْمَمْنَاهَا بِعَشْرٍ فَتَمَّ مِيْكَاتُ رَبِّهِ أَرْبَعِينَ لَيْلَةً mm -hmm. When Allah Azza wa Jal promised Nabi Musa and called him up to the mountains for 30 days and he added upon these 30 days another 10 days making it a total of 40 days. This is a verse talking about the incident when Nabi Musa was called up to the heavens and the entire Tawrat was revealed upon him. Mm -hmm. Nabi Musa was going to be away, physically, away from his people for a period of 40 days. Hence, in his absence, what did Nabi Musa do? وَقَالَ مُوسَى لِأَخِيهِ هَارُونَ أَخْلُفْنِي فِي قَوْمِي وَأَسْلِحْ وَلَا تَتَّبِعْ سَبِيلَ الْمُفْسِدِينَ When he was leaving for the mountains, while he was going to be absent from the people, Nabi Musa made his brother Harun, his Khalifa, and said to him, وَأَسْلِحْ فِي قَوْمِ وَأَسْلِحْ وَلَا تَتَّبِعْ سَبِيلَ الْمُفْسِدِينَ mm -hmm. Ensure that there is virtuousness, rough translation, within our nation, within my nation, and do not follow the path of those who have gone astray or for those who mislead other people. The word over here is وَقَالَ مُوسَى لِأَخِيهِ هَارُونَ خْلُفْنِي فِي قَوْمِ Musa said to Harun, I make you a Khalifa over my ummah. Yani Musa is appointing the next Khalifa. The Nabi is appointing his brother as his Khalifa. Subhanallah. And we have a hadith in which there is again ittifaq between the Amma and the Khassa where Rasulullah said to Amirul Mu'mineen, Anta minni bi manzilati Haruna min Musa. Except that you are the same position to me as Harun was to Musa, except that there is no Nabi after me. But, the, yes, there is no Nabuwa, but in the issue of Khilafah, mm -hmm. yani the lesson that we take from this verse in the Quran, if Nabi Musa, who is going to be physically absent for his com from his community for a period of 40 days, leaves behind the Khalifa, appoints a Khalifa for the people, then what about Rasulullah, who is leaving physically the dunya? Mm -hmm. He doesn't leave behind the successor. And he's supposed to be the best in the seal of all prophets. Yeah. For the notion that uh, the Khalifa should be nominated from amongst the people, 
contradicts the Quran, contradicts the Sunnah of all the other previous prophets before Rasulullah. But Shaykh, what would happen to a community, to the religion of Islam, if Rasulullah didn't leave a successor? Of course. The problem number one is that when you do not have a divinely appointed successor, the first issue is the issue of elections. You nominate a person, you elect a person amongst yourselves. What if this individual does not represent the majority? Can you impose the nomination of a minority upon a majority? Even according to secular, atheistic, democratic principles, it doesn't make sense. Number two, can you impose the election of a certain or the nomination of a certain individual 1400 years ago? Can you impose the nomination of that individual 1400 years ago on this generation, this day and age? On what basis? So there are major issues when it comes to uh, justifying or warranting the issue of nomination. This is number one. Number two is that the problems that we see in Islam today is a direct consequence of the fact that people insisted on the belief that the Holy Prophet did not leave a successor. The first problem that comes out is the misinterpretation of the Quran. Because as we earlier said, one of the responsibilities of the successor of the Holy Prophet is to preserve the interpretation of the religion which is taken from the Quran. Mm -hmm. So the first consequence of not having a divinely appointed successor is that the Quran is open to misinterpretation from fallible people. Mm -hmm. And this is tamaman 100% what we see in this day and age. You look at the verses of the Quran mm -hmm. that are justified by organizations such as Al-Qaeda and Daesh. Every beheading that they have carried out, they have used the Quran to justify. Yeah. Sexual abuse and slavery of women, be it from the Yazdi community or any other community, they use the Quran to justify this. Yeah. Every video production that is made by a terrorist organization, such as Al-Qaeda, such as Daesh and outside of them. And this is something that is information that is available for the public to see. Mm. Every video broadcast before any suicide bombing or any terrorist attack, they have began their video with the recitation of Quran and citing verses from the Quran. And we say this is our first problem over here. The first consequence of straying away from an appointed successor, appointed by Allah and his prophet, the successor, the appointed yes, Yani, by Allah, the communication through the prophet. Yes, the first issue is the misinterpretation of the Quran yes. to justify war and bloodshed on earth. Number two, deviation. When interpretation of the Quran is taken from other than the successor of the holy prophet, in the absence of the prophet, yeah, we are assuming, Misinterpretation, yani deviation. Yeah. It is Muslim scholars who came forward and attributed bodily characteristics to the creator of the universe. Within the books of the Muslims, Allah has a leg. Within the book of the Muslims, Allah sits on a throne. Within the book of the Muslims, God is not just. All this ideological deviation is a direct consequence of the Ummah not referring back to that appointed successor of the Holy Prophet mm -hmm. because of the insistence on this notion that a Khalifa can be nominated. Tayyip, today you nominate a corrupt one. You nominate somebody who is ignorant of the interpretation of the Quran, ignorant of the Sunnah of Rasulullah. Mm -hmm. So you see that this opens all doors of chaos. And on the other hand, you see the divine wisdom behind the appointment of the holy successor through the Prophet on command of Allah Azza wa Jal. It only makes sense if the successor is the representative of Allah, 
then the representative of Allah is selected by Allah. How can I have a representative of Allah who is not even the choice of Allah? Impose my choice on Allah Azza wa Jal? Cannot work. What's the Sunni perspective of what happened at Ghadir? The first thing we need to understand about the hadith of that we have of Ghadir is that, for example, Allama Amini mentions in his hadith that 110 companions of the Prophet of Islam have narrated it. Mm. And he said this isn't something that we should be surprised about when hundreds of thousands were there. Okay. 110 companions of the Prophet of Islam narrate this hadith. And this hadith uh, is very unique in the sense that we have what we call in the sciences of hadith tawatur. Tawatur means that it's very widely narrated, it's so widely narrated, any hadith, that we don't require to look at the chain of narrations and narrators. Mm. So for example, if I have one hadith coming from 15 different separate chains, I don't need to look at each one because I know that 15 separate people from separate groups, from separate tribes, wouldn't have made this hadith up. Tawatur. So Tawatur is the greatest type of hadith, the strongest type. Tawatur then also has different categories. Tawatur lefdi, Tawatur ma'nawi, Tawatur ijmali. The best of these is Tawatur lefdi, where all of those different riwayat that we have those chains have mentioned the riwayat with the same wording. Okay. So of course this strengthens it. Sometimes they didn't mention it in the same wording, they have slight differences. مثلا. Tawatur lefdi, no. All of them from the different chains have the same wording. The example that they give is Al-A'malu bin Niyat. This hadith is said to be Tawatur Lafdi. Different chains all mentioning the same wording. Al-A'mal bin Niyat. An example of Tawatur Lafdi in hadith is hadith of Ghadir. Man kuntu mawla fahada aliyun mawla. Okay. Allahumma wali man wala wa ali man hat. Ahl al-Sunnah number one. All of them accept that this event took place. So okay. they, they, they accept that it, takes, it took place. For example, I have here Ibn Taymiyyah mentions وَثَبَتَ فِي سَحِي مُسْلِمْ أَنْ زَيْدِ بِنْ أَرْقَمْ They narrate from Zayd ibn Arqam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, and it's proven from Sahih Muslim and Zayd ibn Arqam أَنَّهُ قَالْ خَطَبَنَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ بِغَدِيرِ يُدْأَ خُمْ بَيْنَ مَكَّةَ وَالْمَدِينَةِ He gave a khutbah to us in a place called Khum in between Mecca and Medina. Zayd ibn Arqam mentions the riwayah about what takes place. Ibn Hajar says, إِنَّ حَدِيثَ الْغَدِيرِ السَّحِيهٌ لَا مُرْيَةَ فِيهِ There's no doubt about this hadith, it's sahih. Wow. خُوب. وَلَا إِلْتِفَاتِ لِمَنْ قَدَهَا فِي سِحَّتِهِ وَلَا لِمَنْ رَدَّهِ And don't, there is no paying attention to that person who tries to say it's weak, who tries to negate it. Mm. So they accept the hadith awwalan that it took place because you can't de 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 deny it. When so many companions and tabi'een and Sahih Muslim and Fakhrazi and Tafsir ibn Kathir and all of these have mentioned. Okay. So they didn't deny that it took place. What did they deny? They denied what it signified. Uh -huh. So they tried in different ways to explain that this was in actual fact something different. It wasn't appointment of succession and imam and wilayah. What did they say? For example, they said, number one, that what this uh, whole issue was about was that before the farewell hajj, the Amir al was in Yemen. He was sent to Yemen. By the Prophet of Islam, mm. They said there were certain people that spoke out against Amir al-Mu'mineen in Yemen and so he was upset. And so in response to them, the Prophet of Islam took Amir al-Mu'mineen and said, look, whatever you have said, it's not true. He's all of our friends and he's my friend. Okay. So they said it wasn't to do with appointment. It was rather to do with, no, he is our friend. We accept him to be our friend. And those people that spoke out against Amir al-Mu'mineen, you shouldn't have done that. That's how the first thing they, tr they tried to do. Here our ulama of course give the very simple example that if it was to do with friendship why then would he say am I not awla bikum min anfusikum? Why would the Prophet of Islam say do I not have a right over you? Mm -mm. Here awla doesn't mean do I not have friendship over you? Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. It means of course do I not have a right over you in leadership? Why would he say I'm about to pass away let me mention this before I pass away just for friendship of Amin what meaning? That's the first thing they said. Yeah. The second thing some tried to say which was very funny was that they tried to say Amir al Mu'mineen wasn't even in Ghadir in the first place. This was a very uh, few number of people. Many of the Sunni ulama, as we've just seen, said, how can you say that when Ghadir is mutawatir? Mm -hmm. So that was something which was very uh, weak. 
A third group came and said that the hadith isn't sahih. We've just read from Sahih Muslim and Ibn Hajar that the hadith is sahih and mm. 110 companions mentioned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then what did they say? They said it took place. Amir Mu'minin was there. It was just to show his great merit. But there is no mulazimah. There is no necessity between him having great merit and he, him being the successor of the Prophet. This is what they mm. said. And then they also, which was the biggest uh, criticism they had, which our ulama replied to in depth, was the issue of Mawla mm. and the meaning of the word Mawla. Speaker's Corner is a famous area in London where many people gather to preach and speak about their ideas. Many Shias and Sunnis come here to discuss and debate the aspects of Islam that the two schools of thoughts disagree on the most. As I was unable to get a statement from the Sunni scholar, I thought I should go and see what the everyday Sunni knows about Ghadir. Nabi Aula. Nabi Aula means he has an authority over you. Okay, Aula. Then? Bil Mu'minina, men amfusi. That's the only part he used. Yes, yes. He didn't go on to the... Because no. if you want to go on to the rest of the verse, then we're going to have to start talking well, about the rest, well, of the, the, the rest of the verse. Demolish your beliefs. Says, and the wife of the Prophet... But did he, did he bring mother, it? Did he bring uh, it in Ghadir? their mothers. Did he bring it in Ghadir? Yeah, did he bring it in Ghadir? No, you have to answer my question. Did he bring it in Ghadir? Did he say, Wa azwajul Nabi Did he bring Quran. it? Did he, no, no, no. He's already established no, no, no. in the Quran. But the, the Prophet picked that section of the ayah. He said, Alasun Nabi Aula bikum min anfusikum. He just picked that. He stopped there. And they said, Naam ya Rasulullah. He said, Faman kuntu mawla. Fahada Ali mu. It's that simple. Uh, okay. It's that so simple. So you are understanding this is appointment of a leader. Yes, definitely. Okay. So, definitely. The Prophet yeah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has appointed a leader at the time for the Muslims. Okay. Yeah? Yeah. I understand you right. So no, no, not for that. After him. What's after, after him? him? He's saying, is it, do we give walaya for Ali from that time or not from that time? Yeah, of course. Omar, Omar pledged allegiance. Okay, him. so Ali became a leader from that time. Yeah. So we have two leaders for the Muslims. No, you don't have Within to. the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet is one leader and Ibn Abi Talib is the second leader. And we have two leaders. And this is not true. The Prophet Sallallahu he was in charge of the Muslims until he died. He was the one in charge. We go, okay, okay, okay. Let's okay. So okay. you're okay. understanding. You're understanding is wrong. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. That, that, that's in your books. That's not in our books. But, but when he said when he said that I am his mawla and he appointed him as his, the uh, when he after him and I showed you from two different sources from Sunan ibn Majah and from Jami' al-Tirmidhi Walaya we give walaya to Ali you're giving me walaya for Ali and this is Jami' al-Tirmidhi and Sunan ibn we Majah say for Ali. Sunan ibn Majah Sunan ibn Majah and Jami' al-Tirmidhi say uh, that well, Ali is a part of me and I am a part of him and no one shall represent me this is uh, in the in the occasion he sends them as leader for this uh, militant group. Yes, there is the hadith. There is the hadith. I've read it now. She's now, now you're making la, up stuff. La, la, la. Now you're making the up stuff. The hadith is talking. Ali yeah, has been train, appointed as a leader for after the After me. He says, went, after me. Who went for a fight. Habibi, he says, so, after me. Yes, he doesn't after, say after in this him, war. With these people, he appointed No, them. he doesn't say in this war. If the Prophet yeah, yeah, yeah. appointed someone, appointed Ali, anyone, to be the leader for these people, they are traveling for a purpose. So after the Prophet, after they leave the Prophet, who is the leader for them? It is Ali ibn Abi Talib. This is the context of, of the Hadith. Okay. How about how? Okay. Quran says about the Look at this. Look at this. Ibn Abbas said they are attacking a man to whom the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, "You are the Wali of every male and female believer after me." Al Hakim says. Al Hakim says the Hadith has a Sahih chain. Al Dhahabi corroborates him. Sahih. Sunni source, Mustadrak ala Sahihain, volume 2, page 144. And if you want me to bring you the hadith where Umar pledged allegiance to him on the day of Ghadir, I will have to do that. It's not authentic, the part about Umar is not authentic. Yeah. Why, why, why is it not yeah. authentic? It's, it's, all who, who, it's not verified who, to be authentic. Who unauthenticates it? Yeah, the scholars of hadith for Muslims. This part is not authentic. And even if it is authentic, for the sake of the argument, it does not mean leadership. What? Because he pledged allegiance has, to him. Ali has, has chosen, uh, uh, yani if I understand your broken understanding, okay. that Ali, Umar ibn Khattab went for Ali ibn Abi Talib and told him, I accept you as my leader while the Prophet is there. While the Prophet is still alive, <laughs> yani if your understanding is correct, while the Prophet was alive, Umar ibn Khattab uh, gave and accepted Ali to be his leader while the Prophet is alive. 
how it can be that you can have the prophet as the leader of the believers and Ali al as at the same time leader of the believers. Yeah? I'll show you. I'll show you. You got it mixed it again. Sadly, I didn't get what I was looking for. Every time I tried to speak about this topic of Ghadir, the conversation was directed towards the topic of the mothers of the believers. We have different schools of thought based upon the event of Ghadir. The Shia school of thought believing that the event of Ghadir was to appoint Imam Ali السلام, as the successor. Other schools of thought think otherwise. How was the event of Ghadir throughout history, how was it hidden from the people? And why was it hidden? It's a very good question. A very sensitive question, but in the pursuit of truth, truth must be told. There are multiple reasons for this. One of this was in this day and age and throughout history, the reality of Ghadir was hidden because one of these reasons be upon the martyrdom of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa alayhi wa sallam, there was a systematic approach implemented to prohibit and prevent the recording and the transmission of narrations. Mm -hmm. Conveying hadith was a crime. In the first days, of the Muslim Ummah upon the martyrdom of Rasulullah during the rule of Abu Bakr, Umar ibn Khattab, and Uthman ibn Affan, it is a known fact that steps, governmental steps were taken to systematically remove and get rid of and destroy the hadith literature that existed in regards to the Holy Prophet. We have a text which is a very famous text and a very well-referenced text, references from both schools of thought, the Amma and the Khasa, a book known as Man'u uh, Tadween al-Hadith or the prohibition to record uh, hadith. Uh, authored by uh, His Eminence Ali Shahristani mm -hmm. and uh, it's a very well referenced book and I'd advise you know for yourself for myself and for all our viewers to refer back to this book in order to be able to see what the reality was in terms of crimes committed against our Islamic heritage literature mm -hmm. the ahadith of Rasulullah so the first answer is that the leaders of Saqifah upon taking power had implemented this strict rule that no hadith was to be conveyed and all hadith that were prior previously recorded during the time of Rasulullah were actually to be burnt. And you find that through this eradication of hadith, the many merits and the many virtues of Amirul Mu'mineen including those virtues and the event of Eid al-Ghadir, this was the first step in obliterating the dhikr or the remembrance of the event of Ghadir and the divine or the uh, divinely granted position to Amir al-Mu'mineen and his family. Mm. And then you see that throughout history this continued during the time of Muawiyah. Uh, during the time of uh, Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, you see that people were persecuted yeah. just on the basis of not, not only being the Shia of Amir al Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib, but recording or transmitting hadith of Ali ibn Abi Talib. These were people who got killed for this. Let's say the event of Ghadir happened and everyone acknowledged Imam Ali السلام, to be the Khalifa and you know we didn't have events such as Saqifa take place do you think Imam Hussain السلام, would be killed do you think the Shia who are the minority in the world today do you think they would be in fear do you think they'd be slaughtered say the Shuhada Aba Abdullah al Hussein السلام, was martyred in Karbala as a, this martyrdom, this 
open persecution and the killing of Imam al Hussein and his companions was a direct consequence of what happened in Saqifah. And the command of Ghadir being disobeyed. Prior to the martyrdom of Rasulullah, the household, the holy household, was one that was held with esteem and great reverence from amongst the Ummah because there are hundreds of verses revealed in the Quran that speak about the sanctity of the family of Rasulullah, the ayah of Tathir, for example, being one of them, Ahlul Kisa. Mm -hmm. But when the event of Saqifah occurred and the commandment of Allah through Rasulullah on Eid al Ghadir was disobeyed, the people of Saqifa eradicated this level of sanctity associated with Ahlul Bayt, this esteem that was associated with Ahlul Bayt. They violated that number one by having the audacity to burn the house of Sayyidah Zahra and assault her. The fact that they had the audacity to physically assault the daughter of the Prophet, this now opened the doors for anyone and anybody who wanted to make a claim to Islamic leadership. If this Ahlul Bayt stood up as an opposition, they now found an excuse and they, had a, they found this excuse to physically attack them and kill them in the worst way possible because there was a precedent already set during Saqifah. Mm -hmm. Allah Azza wa Jal created us such that we may fulfill the purpose of our existence, be prosperous in this world as well as the hereafter. And in order for this to happen, he selected for us these divinely appointed guides. Mm. But when mankind decided to follow shaitan and wage war on Allah, we see the destruction and the chaos in the name of ideology in front of us today. And this is a direct consequence of disobeying the command of Allah and his prophet for Eid al Ghadir, yeah. which is why we are of the opinion, mm. not only the opinion, but we have this firm belief backed by fact from Hadith and Quran that in order for peace and tranquility and justice to prevail on earth, in order for prosperity to prevail on earth, we have to go back to the Ahlul Bayt. It is their leadership, it is their teachings that ensure that prosperity will prevail on earth. From my research, it's evident that the event of Ghadir plays a major role in the division between Muslims. Although we spoke to the Shia scholars such as Sheikh Muhammad Abbas Panju and Sheikh Shabbar Mahdi, and they gave us a clear perspective of the Shia view of the event of Ghadir, many scholars that we contacted were not happy to speak to us on camera, and we encountered a similar situation in Speaker's Corner where Sunni brothers were not willing to speak to us on camera. And when we did get a person to speak, it turned into a massive debate. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has never left this earth without a divine authority. <laughs>